Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is The Changing Song of the Sea, which will be presented by Tim Gordon. So Tim is a marine biologist based at the University of Exeter and the Australian Institute of Marine Science, where his research focuses on marine bioacoustics. Tim's research aims to understand more about the likely impact climate change and human noise pollution is having on the natural sounds of marine ecosystems. He focuses mainly on coral reef ecosystems, combining field experiments on fish behaviour with com computational analysis of sound recordings. Today, Tim is going to share some of his current research and discuss the impact this interference on, marine, on natural marine acoustics is having on the ecosystem. So as always, there'll be a chance for you to ask your questions to Tim at the end of the presentation. So do submit these in the Q&A option, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Please do so at any point during his presentation and I will ask these on your behalf at the end. So thank you all for logging in and I'll now hand over to Tim. Thanks very much. Um, real pleasure to be sharing our work um, here today. Admittedly, slightly strange situation, <laughs> sat up in my attic, um, trying to work out this whole work from home thing like everyone else is. Um, but thanks very much for tuning in um, nonetheless, and hopefully all the tech runs smoothly. Um, so I work in um, the University of Exeter and in the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Uh, I'm split between those two institutes, uh, working in a big research group um, full of wonderful people who have helped to do all of the work that I'm presenting today. Um, field science is far from being a sort of individual pursuit anymore, I think. Uh, and so I'd like very much to acknowledge uh, the brilliant team that I'm part of here. Uh, and as well as our close team in Exeter, uh, we collaborate with people from around the world. So uh, a whole host of experts and collaborators in research groups in America and um, Australia uh, and Southeast Asia and some wonderful institutes that support our work as well. So big thanks to them. Just before we start today, I'd like you to imagine um, what it's like to be in the sea. It may be some time since uh, some of you were in the sea with the current regulations, uh, or maybe you're lucky enough to live somewhere close to the sea and you can get out with your you know, socially distanced two meters allocated exercise and, and go for a swim. But, but either way, cast your mind back to the last time you were underwater, uh, because the sea is a very different world to the world that we're used to living in. Uh, see, the dominant sense that we use as terrestrial mammals, as humans, uh, is sight most of the time and we're used to being able to see quite a long way uh, relative to the sensory halo of our other senses but when you're underwater uh, it, it's opposite to that you can't see very far at all even on a really clear day in good conditions in really clear water on a tropical coral reef you can still probably only see 20 or 30 meters around you but because water is denser than air sound travels five times faster through water than it does through air and sound travels really far and really fast. And so it's a really good sensory modality for animals to use underwater. So it's, it's a really dominant way that animals live their lives. Uh, and that is true, especially on coral reefs. Uh, coral reefs are the noisiest ecosystem in the sea. Uh, and there's all sorts of sounds that you can hear. We don't usually associate the underwater world and reefs with sound, uh, but that is more because we are not used to it. Our ears don't work particularly well underwater. We're not used to listening out for stuff when we go snorkeling or scuba diving. But when you listen through a, um, an underwater microphone, a hydrophone, uh, it's a whole different story. So if you make sure your, your sound's nice and high, um, I'm gonna share some of the sounds that are, we've recorded with our hydrophones uh, when we do our research. So the first is a snapping shrimp. Uh, that's top left on this um, collage. Uh, and this is really the backing track of reef sound. You hear it all the time. It's thousands of these shrimp clicking their claws uh, and they create this background crackle that sounds like this. And then, so that background crackle's going on all the time. And then punctuated on top of that, you hear noises that fish make and they really are quite diverse. So this is a fish called a Sergeant Major. You hear that sort of purring low pitch sound. Uh, and then if you're listening carefully, you might have heard at the end of that little clip, uh, there was a slightly higher pitch sound. So I've pulled that out and amplified it for you. And that is an Ambon damselfish. And here it is um, a little bit louder. 
So it's sort of high pitched um, whooping sound, almost like a dove or something. Uh, and then there's, uh, so that, that's a, um, another type of sound you hear. There's also this one made by a fish called the reef croaker. So a, a knocking sound. It's actually making that sound by contracting the uh, circular muscles that go around its swim bladder and hitting the swim bladder with its muscles and playing its own swim bladder like a drum. Uh, and then uh, this is the sound that clownfish make. They rattle their teeth together and talk to each other in their anemone. Uh, and then as well as the sounds that we know what they are, there's all sorts of different mystery sounds. So swimming around a reef, you'll hear sounds that frankly nobody knows what makes them, why the animal's making them, um, and, and it, it's still undescribed. Uh, so these are a few sounds that I've recorded that I've no idea what fish make them. That sort of rising humming sound. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of infuriating. You're swimming around thinking, I've no idea what any of these fish are, what, what, any, what fish are making any of these noises. Uh, and it's been almost, you almost imagine that the fish are laughing at you. Um, and then sometimes it even sounds like they are. So here's a fish having a chuckle. Yeah, sort of, we call that the, um, the pub belly laugh. It sort of sounds like some old geezer on the end of the bar, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, so coral reefs are noisy places. Um, and that is important for answering one of uh, biology's great mysteries, which is how does Nemo find home? Um, so coral reef fish, for the most part, live their adult lives on the reef. Um, but almost all the organisms on a reef will have a juvenile phase. Um, where as larvae, they are swept out into the open ocean. Uh, so eggs hatch on a reef, um, but then immediately the currents sweep them out into the deep blue uh, and they spend the first few weeks of their life floating out there because it's less of a dangerous habitat for them. There are fewer predators uh, and they can grow up until the point where they're sort of a bit more competent. And then as juveniles, they come back to the reef and settle. So it's like this real life Finding Nemo odyssey that they have to go through. Uh, but in the absence of any friendly sea turtles to point them in the right direction, they have to navigate themselves. Uh, one of the key ways that they do that is by listening. Uh, because coral reefs are very noisy and because the sound travels well underwater, from a long distance away, these tiny baby fish are able to cue into the sound of a reef, make decisions based on the habitat quality, based on what they can hear, uh, and then swim towards it and choose a reef to settle. Uh, that's how things work on a normal healthy coral reef system. Um, reefs around the world today, however, are degrading very fast, faster than they ever have before in history. Uh, most of the work I do is based at a place called Lizard Island. Uh, it's a small island in the northern half of the Great Barrier Reef where there's a research station. Um, and it's a reef that we've worked at for a long time, we've understood the ecological dynamics of the system for a long time. Uh, but it's also a reef that has recently uh, become, I think, one of the most severely, it's probably a case study in, in terms of the most severe rapid degradation uh, we've seen almost on, on any coral reef around the world. Uh, so in 2012, um, the reefs were really quite healthy. Uh, and then in 2014, they got hit by Cyclone Ita. Uh, that was the strongest cyclone ever recorded in that area of the barrier reef. The very next year, um, while they were trying to recover, they got hit by Nathan. That was another uh, very strong cyclone that crucially came from the opposite direction. So that means that any of the reefs that sort of survived in the lee shore of Ita uh, got hit by winds coming from the other way uh, by Nathan. So the, the reefs really got turned around and smashed to bits. Uh, and then, of course, the mass bleaching, which is now infamous uh, and across the media. Um, the first of these three global mass bleaching events uh, hit Lizard Island in a big way at the end of 2015. Uh, the first time I went to Lizard Island as a researcher was 2016, so I never actually saw it healthy. Um, I arrived to find this sort of apocalypse, um, post-degradation reefscape. Um, the colour had gone, um, a lot of it was reduced to rubble, it was, it was heartbreaking to be honest with you. Um, and the first thing I did when I arrived at this sort of um, really degraded uh, reef was I, I took recordings. I took recordings of the sound of it. And specifically, I took our instruments to places where my research groups and our colleagues had taken recordings previously. And I dug out all of those past recordings back from when the reefs were healthy. And I went to the same place 
uh, at the same time of year, at the same time of day, I set up the same equipment in the same way, uh, and I recorded again. And this is what I heard. So this is a pre-degradation healthy reefscape from Lizard Island taken in 2012. And here's the same reef four years later. I think that's tragic. I think it's really heartbreaking. You can hear the coral reef dying. You can hear the change. And you can't just hear it, you can put numbers on it as well. Um, these are four ways that, basically four nerdy ways of putting numbers to sounds um, and describing quantitatively the difference in a natural soundscape. So we have acoustic complexity in the top left, that's a way of measuring um, how much variability there is in a natural soundscape. And acoustic richness is kind of a measure of how many different sound types you're hearing. Snap rate is a measure of how many of those individual little um, snapping shrimp clicks there are that make up the background crackle. And then sound pressure level is, to all intents and purposes, a measure of volume. Uh, and so you can see what you could hear, that the soundscape is less complex, there is less going on, and it is quieter um, when it's degraded on the right in the green boxes than when it was healthy on the left in the blue. So that is sad in and of itself, but it's also concerning um, for this, you know, Nemo finding home thing. This, this sound plays an important role in the natural history processes of a coral reef. It's important for um, allowing these recruiting fish and these organisms coming back to the reef to find a way home. So we wanted to know, well, what implications are there if the soundscape changes for these recruiting fish? So we did two experiments. Um, well, one experiment with two parts. And so when you think of fish recruitment, you can think of it as a two-part process. So over on the right of this uh, Microsoft Paint schematic, you can see that there's lots of little, little fish that are a pre-settlement stage and they're still larvae out in the deep blue sea on the right of the screen there. Um, and they will be looking out and, well, listening out for a reef um, to find and they'll be making what we call orientation decisions. Um, they'll hear a sound and they'll swim towards it, but they're not settling yet, they're just coming towards it. And then when they arrive at the reef, they make the decision to either settle or not. So either to keep looking for another reef or to swim down, find somewhere, find a hole to sort of hunker down in and make that their home. So the first stage, this orientation in deep water, we can test using light traps. Uh, so these kind of work like moth traps, they're um, floating underwater boxes with a bright light in. Uh, the fish are attracted to the light and they swim towards it. Um, it's a research assistant tied to one of them there. Um, mm -hmm. and we can put loudspeakers on the light, light traps um, and compare what happens when we play different sounds to compare the relative attractiveness of each sound. And then to test the settlement response, uh, we do a similar thing but using um, patches of degraded habitat. So we just literally make a, a pile of old dead coral rubble on the sea floor, and then we made it sound either like a healthy reef or like a degraded reef um, using large. So that's testing, rather than the deep water orientation behavior, the settlement decision of the fish. So in both of these um, studies, we used a, a triplicate design. Um, so we had one set of either traps or reefs playing uh, the post-degradation, 2016 quiet reef sound. We have one playing the pre-degradation healthy uh, 2012 loud reef sound. And we have one playing an ambient sound. So that is basically, it's just playing the sound of silence. It's playing a recording we took in the deep sea where there's no reef and you can't hear anything. But it's just controlling for the fact that we've got an active loudspeaker in the water. So it's our experimental control. And if there was no impact of the sound on the fish recruitment, you'd expect to see um, the distributions around this red line because we got three treatments so you'd expect to see 33 percent of the catch um, in each of our treatments whereas in fact we see this and we see the same pattern in both studies we see that the pre-degradation healthy sounds are more attractive than the post-degradation um, 2016 sounds and what's more those degraded 2016 sounds in our experimental design they're no more attractive than the sound of an empty ambient ocean. So that's really distressing, that's really concerning to us um, because we're worried that this now might be going on. Uh, we already know that disturbance events cause habitat degradation um, and we know on the on the left hand side there of this loop um, 
that when you have fewer fish and reduced recruitment, the reef struggles to recover because reefs need their fish. And so now it seems that when the habitat degrades, there is an acoustic change, you can hear it degrading, and further that quieting of the reef might cause reduced recruitment. It's less attractive to fish, so you get fewer fish, and you can see how that might, uh, the fewer fish attracted by the quieter reef might cause the reef to degrade further, and we go round and round. So it's a pretty depressing study um, in a lot of ways. Um, and so having, having done this experiment and, and written up the paper, we sat as a research group and thought, well, that was depressing, um, but, but what's next? Um, where do we go from there? As a marine biologist, that's not the sort of experiment you dream of doing. Um, I don't think anybody, I certainly didn't, and I don't know that any of my colleagues dreamt of going to study the natural world so that they could describe its decline in such horrifying technical detail. Um, these are not pictures that we want to take as scientists, they're not experiments that we want to do. Um, the, f the first thing we did was we, we actually started writing about how it made us feel. Um, I think that's quite important. Um, not many scientists talk about this. Uh, and so we wrote a, a letter to science uh, explaining that um, the rates of environmental destruction that scientists today are measuring are unprecedented uh, and that it is important that we deal and address the feelings that that creates uh, to use them as inspiration to look forward um, and inspiration to work out how we can still move forward in the world today as environmental scientists. Uh, and then having sort of thought about that as an approach, uh, we, tried to, we tried to do that. So we now aim to use the research that we do to use our new understanding of the sounds of coral reefs uh, to try and work out how we can paint a better picture for their future. Um, in essence, we don't want to just describe the changing song of the sea. Uh, we want to work out whether we can do anything about it. So with three ideas, um, and these are all ideas that we're working on at the moment. They're all quite new. Um, none of these are sort of fully packaged, ready to go solutions. Uh, they're our attempt to work out how we can use our current knowledge to best manage coral reefs in a changing world. So the first idea, I'll just run you through all three of them um, relatively quickly now. So the first idea is that actually we could use bioacoustics as a new way of monitoring reef health. Um, monitoring the health of a reef is really important both to understand when it's degrading but also to understand when it's recovering uh, and to, to measure the success or otherwise of reef rehabilitation programs. Uh, that if they have proven measures of their success, then that can help them to achieve funding. Um, or conversely, if something isn't working, it can help them to try and understand why not. Um, so we are collaborating with the Mars Coral Reef Rehabilitation Program. Uh, this is the biggest one in the world at the moment, to our knowledge. Uh, they're based in Indonesia, and they have this amazing technique where they uh, create these metal frames, you can see on the right, and they tie tiny little fragments of coral to them. And then they swim them down to the ocean floor and they hammer them into the seabed um, and sort of lash them all together and make sure they stay there. And at the start, you get this carpet of metal frames across. You can see what was a, a pretty degraded reef scale. Uh, and then over time, astonishingly, the coral grows really, really quickly. And you can see that as the coral grows over the frame, it quite quickly, within two or three years, gets to the point where you can't see the frame anymore. And actually, this carpet of coral has come back. Um, and it's, it shows really exciting signs of uh, rehabilitation. But one of the important questions here is whether you have just grown coral or whether you've actually grown a full ecosystem. Uh, sound is a good way of measuring a whole ecosystem because so many different animals make sounds. Um, it's potentially a more holistic way of measuring the ecosystem health rather than just quantifying coral cover. And it's also a nice way of measuring because it's completely um, objective. Uh, there's no um, danger that you might get a different result if a different person is doing a survey or if you're, um, you know, the visibility of the water is different. So you see different numbers of fish or whatever. It, it's a nice objective measure of reef health because you just take the recording with a microphone and you run the numbers through a computer. Uh, so we've gone along to a few places now um, in this Indonesian restoration program and taken some recordings uh, and some of the initial results are quite encouraging. 
Uh, so you can see on the top row there is a degraded reef. You can see there's pretty much no live coral. It's been dynamite fished. Um, a lot of bomb blasting has caused a lot of damage there. You can see on a representative quadrant that it's pretty much rubble and sand. Uh, and you can see from the spectrogram on the right, uh, that's basically a way of graphing sound where red is louder sounds and blue and white are quieter sounds. You can see it's quite quiet. Whereas actually when you look at the, the spider, that's what we call those metal frames, the restoration, you can see in the pictures that there's much more coral and it looks much more like the healthy reef on the bottom. And you can see in the spectrogram that the sound is much more similar. Uh, so as well as looking at the overall sound picture, um, I pulled out a bunch of the fish noises, um, sounds some of which I played you earlier. Um, so the scraping and the knocking and the grunts and the growls and the buzzes and all that you can hear. And you can see here they're graphed through time. So you can see that some of them are, are sounds you hear mainly in the day. You mainly hear scraping sounds in the day as all the um, diurnal herbivores, the parrot fishes and stuff are active and you can hear them scraping away. Uh, and then some fish are active in evening and morning, uh, just like birds. Um, you get a, a dawn chorus in particular with birds. Well, you get a dawn and a dusk chorus as well um, with coral reef fish. So that the knocking and the grunting and the growling tends to come out there. And then there's some sounds that we hear almost exclusively at night. These are the nocturnal fish coming out and they make different sounds again. And on the left here, when you split those sounds um, up and you look at where we're hearing them, we're actually, mo for most of the sounds, we're hearing them much more in the healthy and the restored habitat than we are in the degraded habitat. And then when you look on the right, uh, that's where I've summed up all of these sounds. Um, and we're looking at the total number of sound types that you can hear in each recording. You can see we're hearing more sound types in general in the healthy and the restored reefs than we are in the degraded reefs. So it, none of this is published yet. This is all stuff that I'm actively working on at the moment, but it looks promising. It looks like sound might be a new way of measuring the health of a reef, which is potentially useful. And then the flip side is, well, as well as listening, could we use loudspeakers? Could we use bioacoustics to manage reef restoration? So on a small local scale where people are trying to rebuild their um, reefs one frame at a time, as you saw with the process uh, a few slides ago, we wonder, well, if, the, if when the sound is quiet, the fish don't arrive, can you sort of fake it at the start? Could you play a bit of sound at the start, bring some of the fish back in, kickstart the restoration? and accelerate the process in those early stages. So to test that we did an experiment, uh, we're back in Australia now, um, and did an experiment where I made 36 little um, fake degraded patches. So these are just piles of coral rubble scattered around the bay. Um, none of them have any live coral on them yet, um, so that they all should be a pretty bad place for a fish to live. Um, and then on a third of them, I put no loudspeaker at all. That's the red dots. Uh, the orange dots, a third of them, I put a dummy loudspeaker uh, where the whole rigmarole is there, but it's not playing any sound. Uh, and then on the blue ones, I put an active loudspeaker. We're calling this acoustic enrichment. Um, so I'm playing this healthy reef sound. And we left them for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, we wanted to know, how's the fish community developing? Um, so th this is more than just, are we attracting fish? Uh, this is, are they going to stay? Are they going to set up shop? Are they going to form a community on this rubble patch? And the dummy and the loudspeaker reefs um, both did almost exactly the same thing, as you would imagine. Um, the, the, the dummy loudspeaker, to remind you, is turned off, so it sounds exactly the same as if there's no loudspeaker there. It's just a different experimental control. And some fish come and arrive, but you end up with, this is just measuring the damselfish, because they're easy, easy to um, measure through time. You don't have to sort of destroy the reef to count them. But when you look at the acoustic enrichment, you get nearly twice the number of damselfish arriving. Uh, they arrive quite quickly at the start in those first sort of 10 or 15 days. You immediately see the curve go up uh, and then they plateau at a higher level than the unenriched reefs. And then at the end of the 40 days, uh, rather than just looking at damselfish, I could pull the reefs apart and look at all of the fish that were there, even the ones that sort of hide away and you don't see unless you start to really pull the reef apart. And we can see that this pattern of attraction um, is ubiquitous across herbivores and mixed diet, fish with a mixed diet, so omnivores, planktivores, invertivores, and even the, the predators, even the piscivores. You're getting more of these fish when you play the sound. So it looks like there's a, a whole community developing. Uh, and, and you can see here a summary. 
not only have we got a higher abundance of fish, uh, but we've got higher species richness and even a slightly higher Shannon diversity. So this was quite encouraging. It suggests, at, at least on a small scale, on a scale that would be feasible to sort of regrow corals by planting frames and by you know introducing loudspeakers into the system, it might be possible to reverse the acoustic de degradation we see with loudspeakers, uh, and that that might increase recruitment. And we hope that might then lead to ecosystem recovery happening a little bit, accelerating some of the natural processes. Uh, and finally, th this is actually the one that in some ways excites me the most. Um, this is perhaps a bit more of a left field way of using bioacoustics to help coral reefs, uh, but I think it's probably the most important. Uh, we're, we're getting to a stage where actually around the world we can replant reefs and we can make small scale changes. We can put that because in the water we can try and regrow some corals on a small scale. But if we're serious about saving coral reefs on a global scale, uh, the, the only thing that's going to work is to get a handle on climate change and get a handle on it really quickly. Uh, that's going to require very fast, um, large scale social shifts um, and changes in behavior on a social and polit political level. Uh, so increasingly, we take seriously our opportunity and our responsibility as environmental scientists to act as environmental advocates. So, and I think bioacoustics gives us a sort of interesting way in, in an interesting way of talking to people that maybe piques their curiosity, um, that maybe captures their imagination, captures their hearts in a, in a way that they're not quite used to. For some reason, the sound in nature seems to have this effect. And, don't quite know why, but but it's certainly pervasive through popular culture. So you know the hills are alive with the sound of music. Um, Pocahontas sings about um, what is it? Painting with all the sing with all the colours of the mountain, or paint with all the colours of the mountain, or something. Um, it, anyway, there, there's something in that song, isn't there? Um, and then of course Jacques Cousteau's uh, infamous um, Mont du Silence. Really, he couldn't have actually been more wrong. It turns out that um, the underwater world is actually quite loud in a lot of places, but it's still this mix of, of wild and, um, and noise. And, and ocean noise seems to be something that captures people's imagination. Uh, this is something that I, I struggle to find data on, um, but perhaps, um, perhaps I can just relate to you some of my experiences uh, that, that I think this is something that works as a very powerful communication tool. Uh, so I've, I've used this a lot. I do a lot of public outreach uh, from talking to school kids to talking on the radio, uh, at science festivals um, and at gatherings of politicians and, and um, economists. And across that spectrum of people, I found that when people are engaged and when they tune into the sounds that they can hear underwater or other sounds that they didn't know they could hear underwater, it really captures their hearts and their imaginations. Uh, and actually, importantly, that changes their behavior some of the time. So you can see on the top quote there, um, Annie thinks the fish sounds are cool. Highlighted in green is the important bit. She now wants to be a marine biologist when she grows up. Uh, and again, you can see, you know, we've done this in schools, in pubs, in churches, in theology colleges, um, on, you know, Twitter, on radio, on TV, all sorts of different audiences. And we always see this, this similar people are engaged and they're interested. And then it seems to, to trigger something that, that they want to make a change. Uh, and so, so I think there is power in um, the, this sense that there's something about the underwater world that is new to them um, and is, is engaging. Um, and I think that's something that's important. Uh, so, so in summary, um, we work on coral reef acoustics, um, bioacoustics underwater, uh, and some of that is, is really tragic. You can hear the degradation that is going on on the world's coral reefs around them, and, um, and, and it's really severe. Um, reefs are degrading, you can hear it happening, and that's concerning not just because it's sad, but because that has implications for fish recruitment. Uh, but actually, as we go forward, there are ways that we can use bioacoustics to monitor our reefs. There are potentially ways we can use it to manage our reefs, and there are ways we can use it to motivate change in people around the world. Uh, and that gives me some hope going forward. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, if anybody is there, I've just been watching my own slides this whole time, um, but I would be delighted to answer any questions. I think there's 60 people online apparently, so if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, or you can drop me an email on my address there in the bottom left if you're catching, if you're catching up on this, not live.
Perfect. Thank you, Tim. That was really interesting. Some, yeah, really hard hitting information there. And like you say, it's quite dis disheartening in a lot of places, but equally some of the approaches that you've had in this research sounds really interesting. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully this will, will, like you say, connect people to influence some sort of change around them. Um, we have had quite a few questions that have come in and one has just asked what negative or general impact, I guess, have you seen on reefs from man-made sound? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, my work in our group is mainly on the natural soundscapes, um, but many other people in our research group work specifically on this question. Um, so we, we see noise from boats, as you say, we also see noise from industry, uh, from construction, from building, um, seismic surveys when they go and look for oil and gas is a big source of underwater noise. They play these really loud sounds um, and then listen for their reflections back. Um, and they, that's how they look for oil and gas reserves, uh, naval sonar, uh, there's all sorts of noise pollution underwater and it, it creates a whole host of problems for marine animals. Um, famously, most a lot of people have heard of that being really distressing for whales and dolphins, uh, which use sound a lot, but actually we're understanding that the same is true for fish, uh, even for invertebrates. Many of these animals use sound underwater, so when there is noise pollution from humans, many of them are distressed and disrupted by that. Uh, the good news is that sound as a pollutant is one that we very much have the power to manage. Uh, so unlike chemical pollution or warming, once we stop making noise in the ocean, the ocean goes quiet straight away. There's no hangover effect of our pollutants. So if we can stop making noise, we can solve that issue straight away for the oceans. Uh, and we have ways that we can solve that issue increasingly. Uh, so there are ships with propellers that are designed to be far quieter than the current builds. Um, there are alternate engine types. Um, there's technologies like bubble curtains. So around something that you're building underwater, if you can imagine a hose pipe that you're blowing air through and then imagine drilling lots of holes in that hose pipe. So when you lay the hose pipe along the bottom of the sea and all the air comes through the holes, it, it makes like this wall of bubbles. Um, that keeps the sound in. Um, so if you, if you have a loud thing like you're pile driving or something on one side of that curtain, the bubbles will reflect the sound. Uh, and so if you put a bubble curtain around your noisy activity, you can sort of insulate it so you can keep the rest of the ocean quieter. So there's, there are lots of problems associated with noise pollution, but there are also lots of solutions. Brilliant. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I've got a kind of two, two in one here and one person has asked, can you quantify the sound sufficiently to act as a long term monitoring tool of reef health? And is there um, seasonal variation that needs to be considered when doing this research? Yeah, no, another really good question. Um, there is seasonal variation, uh, more than seasonal variation, actually, there's daily variation. You saw on the graph I showed there that um, some of the some of the sounds are are in the night and some are in the day. So there's daily variation. We also get variation within a, a monthly cycle um, because of the lunar phase. Different fish act differently at different times of the moon. So we see the sound change uh, and then also through the year seasonally. So there is that variation. Um, but it's possible to control for that if you have long-term recordings. So here's a, and you've managed to unearth an extra bonus slide, um, <laughs> which is great. Um, these are just for, so, so here it is. So these are those graphs that I showed you before, at the, the pre and the post degradation from the Great Barrier Reef, right? But on, and on top, I've mapped some other studies that look at seasonal or lunar or daily variation in soundscapes. And you can see that while there is some variation um, in the red, the blue, and the green, uh, in, compared to the massive changes we found in this study, uh, it, it, it's on a different scale. Uh, so yes, the, the variation is possible, is important to consider when we're um, using this um, as a tool for monitoring, uh, but it's also possible to to model it out, as it were. Sure. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another uh, qu couple of questions around how this research approach can be expanded to investigate the impact of industrial noises around like oil rigs and wind farms, etc. But also whether it could be applied on a terrestrial front in kind of tropical rainforests or something similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I, I chatted a bit before about the impacts of noise pollution. Um, so I'll not dwell on that for too long, but in short, yes, there are lots of studies um, and you can find them quite easily on Google if you're interested in looking at further details where people find both the effects of noise pollution on animals and also the things that we can do to sort it out. Um, and then in terms of the terrestrial stuff, it actually often it, it, it quite often goes the other way. So the terrestrial biology tends to be ahead of marine biology um, in some fields, in quite a few fields actually, because it's easier to work in a terrestrial ecosystem. Um, you don't have to hold your breath basically. So you, you know you don't need all your equipment to be waterproof, you don't need scuba tanks, all that. Um, a lot of people have done similar stuff in terrestrial ecosystems. So people use sound to record the sounds of rainforests and they monitor the, the health of a rainforest by its acoustic recordings. Uh, and people are starting to use playback with varying levels of success um, to help with recolonization, for example, in seabirds. Um, so if they're trying to um, bring back seabirds to recolonize an area, uh, there have been some studies where they've played back the sounds of seabird colonies to try and attract new birds in. Interesting. Wow, that's really clever. Um, something around like how you're monitoring the long-lasting positive effect of the rejuvenation projects and ideas that you shared earlier. Are there longitudinal studies that are being conducted that are kind of monitoring how permanent the recolonization of reefs are? Yeah, um, a great question. Um, th there are, um, in some ways, the difficulty is that as a whole field, coral reef restoration is really very new. Um, this place we're working in Indonesia, for instance, the oldest restored reefs they have are four or five years old, which on an ecological timescale uh, is not very old at all. Uh, so a lot of it is unknown, um, and that's just because coral reef restoration hasn't been around enough for long, for long enough to know. Um, but the rate of growth at the start is certainly encouraging, and we hope that our acoustic measures, as well as other visual measures and chemical measures, um, of the success of the restoration. Uh, we hope the measurements we're taking now and going forward, we're taking these time series year on year, will become really useful in understanding that change, not just in the short-term growth of coral, but in the long-term development of the whole um, ecosystem. Okay, interesting. Um, also, in a slightly different way, is acoustic research um, useful or is there a platform to use it in terms of identifying pollution or um, kind of focused cleaning points for geosp to a geospatial extent? Is there, is there any kind of noise correlation that comes off some sort of polluted sites? Um, not something I've come across directly before. It's certainly an interesting idea. Um, and I guess there's a, there's a difference between what we call passive acoustics which is what we mainly focus on, which is listening to sounds that are made in the ocean, so listening to animals in the ocean, uh, and then active acoustic techniques. And active acoustic detection is, is like um, sonar or like um, echo sounders or depth sounders on a boat or something, right? It's where you, you fire a sound off and you have a detection and you listen for when that sound comes back to you and you pick up the rebounded sound and then you can, to a certain extent, map something using sound. Uh, so I, I guess the active acoustic um, techniques might well be useful in, um, well, they're already useful in, in depth sounding um, places, and they might well be useful in, in looking for other floating objects in the water. I don't know. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's also a couple of questions around your career path and things like this. People, um, we've got quite a lot of students at the IES who are very much engaged in marine and coastal science, but bioacoustics is not a degree, degree program or an area that some have come across before. What sort of route would you advise um, kind of students who are interested in following this career path um, to kind of go through when they're approaching university? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not sure I'm the, the best person to advise on careers yeah. advice. I am. Um, <laughs> I feel I feel all the time like I just sort of stumbled haphazardly through life and you know ended up doing this because it's the email that I happen to check on some day and the you know we'll do whatever but but I guess to an extent that's how we all work right like life's full of weird turning points and decisions and if you spend too long thinking how did I get here then it ends up getting very weird but but anyway um 
bioacoustics is an expanding field. Um, it's not a massive field at all. And so, so what I did is I did a degree, an undergraduate degree in natural sciences, and then a master's in um, conservation and ecology. Uh, and then I did a PhD um, with this research group that I'm working on now. Um, and our specialism as, as a research group is mainly bioacoustics, although we work on lots of other areas of marine ecology as well. So I did some fairly general um, undergraduate and master's degrees. Uh, and then ended up working in this research group because the particular question was of interest to me. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And just to add to that from an IES membership point of view, our career services really support spe especially students looking for mentors for exactly that, that kind of information of speaking to somebody who's further along in their career and asking them how they got to the position that they're in. And some of our members work in one specialism now, but they trained in a completely different specialism. Um, so it's don't think of it as a for some of those students who are thinking the choice of their degree really dictates the future of their career there is an awful lot of uh, movement within the specialisms when you're in the environmental sciences so if you want any more information about that or to be in touch with some of our members who have applied to the mentor scheme you can get in touch with us through the IES website so have a look on there and um, yeah that sounds like a great service I'd recommend them for careers advice over myself without presentation <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and one final question just before we end, we've almost run out of time. And um, just to ask, are some of the reefs that you're working on actually on uh, the protected list at the moment? Yes, so many reefs are protected around the world um, by marine protected areas. Uh, so that basically stops people fishing or reduces the amount that they can fish. Um, and that has been an effective way of managing coral reefs in the past, and to a certain extent is an effective way of managing coral reefs against some stresses today. Uh, the trouble is that probably the biggest threat facing coral reefs is climate change. And when the water warms, the water warms everywhere. It doesn't matter what fishing rules you've got in place. Um, if you get a heat wave, your coral's going to die. Um, and so I think what is important for the management of reefs is that we continue to to use local scale management and local scale restoration techniques, um, some of which I'm talk I've talked about today. Um, and we continue to get the benefits from those that we can, uh, but also that we have to understand as a global community that the only way to save a lot of these places is with um, major and rapid and direct action on carbon emissions. Yeah. And so, it's, so I guess as well as local management, it's really important that as in ecologists and environmental scientists, we are engaged in um, social change. We have to be. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And that's quite a, a nice thinking point to end on. Um, so yeah, just like to thank you, Tim, for delivering that. It was really interesting and people have been really engaged with that. So that's brilliant. Um, and thank you all to everyone who logged in and submitted your questions. I hope you found that useful um, and interesting and I hope it sparked some kind of inspiration for you. So this webinar has been recorded and it'll be made available on our YouTube channel. For those who logged in who are IES members, you can record this as CPD on the IES CPD tool. So log into the members area and follow the information there. Any problems do get in touch with the project office and we can help you out. Um, the next webinar is gonna be on sustainable soil remediation, which is on the 3rd of June. But also on the 2nd of June, we've launched a brand new um, IES forum series, which are afternoon discussion events, which are free for our members to attend. And the first one is going to be looking at legal environmental challenges, exploring some of the impacts that COVID has had um, specifically on planning decisions, breaches in regulation, environmental regulation, and as well as looking at how the sector is going to adapt to changing circumstances and moving forward to a new normal. So if that's of interest to you, you can sign up to that on the IES website as well. All information is on there. So, yeah, just a final thank you to everyone who listened. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and thank you to Tim. Thanks very much.